just going to share a little bit. Um, first of all, um, I have this video. It's about this man I had an experience. He had like 23 minutes in hell. And I looked at it for the second time, and these images just can't get out of my head. You know, I just keep thinking about it, thinking about it. And um, it just makes me real grateful. I'm just real grateful that, um, that I'm not going to a place like that. You know, um, and it just made me, I wanted to go back, I wanted to share with you to go back in the beginning how it all started. We know how it all started, but I just want to just share it over with everybody in here. You know, because um, believe me, all of us in the world, we didn't care about God. Our minds were not on God. You know, we could have been in torment. That, those images, Olivia's seen that movie. It just, it's, even your worst enemies, you don't want to go there. And, you know, and even a lot of us go through our personal struggles. And, um, it's like, man, you know, it's worth for me to shatter my strongholds because, you know what, Jesus Christ, he shattered everything before that, you know. It's like, everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right, you know. So with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and start with the scriptures. Uh, in Genesis, we're going to just go over it. I'm just going to skip uh, Genesis 3, uh, Genesis 3, and I'm going to start with 6. And I got some notes that I'm going to read in between. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, uh, which that the first sin presents the lust of the eyes, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, the pride of life. Uh, she took up the fruit thereof and did eat. All right? And then after that, she took it to Adam. Okay, Let's, let me go back down. So, uh, so then we saw three sins there. Both presents the three temptations, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And that's the first, the first man falls, the second man conquers, which is Jesus. Let's go down to seven. And the eyes of, uh, and the eyes of them both were open. It refers to their conscience, their guilt, as a result of sin. They never saw it before, but that was their guilt. That was, they, they saw that, their conscience awoke. That's what started all this. That's what started all this. Okay, uh, then it says, and they knew that they, they were naked. That refers to the fact that they had lost the light of their purity. That's what covered and clothed their body, their purity. It clothed their body. They, that's all they had with the Lord. That's all they had with God. And they lost it. That's what clothed them was their purity. And they, they uh, sowed fig leaves. Can you imagine trying to get fig leaves or banana leaves or whatever they had around them? That tells you how man tries to cover himself. He tries to be God. He tries to say, I'm okay. I don't need no help. And that's why you got other false religions, because they don't want to think they need our God, which is our, the creator God. And they sold, they sold the fig leaves together and made themselves uh, aprons or whatever. And they heard the voice of the Lord, God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, at that time, the voice of the Lord was always welcome. It was peaceful. It was loving. It was caring. But now to them, they're going to find out that they're afraid of it. And so, uh, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Fear was the first reaction of the fallen man. Adam's conscience of the effect of sin was keener than his sense of sin itself. Because I was naked, I hid myself. He was naked to the judgment of God because of sin, which must be judged. He tried to hide himself from God, but even as untold millions have had, but never with any success. God wanted Adam to know that he was hidden himself from him, but is never hidden from him. And that he who runs away from him can never escape God. God knows everything. No matter, he knows everything. And he said, who told you you were naked? Uh, that carries Adam's mind from the effect to sin that had caused it. As long as man feels sorrow only for the result of his action, there is no repentance. And he has, to wise, he has no wise to return to divine presence. And then the Lord said, have you eaten of the tree where I command you that thou shalt not eat? And the man said, the woman you gave to me, she gave it to me. <laughs> I like only crack up on that part, you know. You know, um, I'm glad that men are, like, men are different today now. We have a lot of good men that won't blame stuff on their wives. 
And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that you have done? So now, let me just go back down. Let me come here, speed it up. Just go to verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us. He knows good and evil. Uh, the Lord knew evil not by personal experience, but rather through omniscience. Man knows evil by becoming evil, which is the forehead of all sorrow for the world, the fountainhead of all sorrows for the world. The pronoun us signifies the, Holy, uh, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So everybody was there. Jesus was there. Everybody was there of the Godhead. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat life forever, this would have been worse thing for all. To all. Imagine if they would have eaten the, the tree of life after they have fallen, that means they would have lived in this sinful body forever. Can you imagine living in this body that just hurts, that just pain? Can you imagine living with the guilt that you've had, living with sorrow, living with an unrepentant heart, living with hatred? Can you imagine the terrorists living forever? It's the horrible thought. So it was an act of mercy that God uh, 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 put the sword. And you're going to read how he kept them and he banished them from eating the tree of life because that would have been horrible. So till the, to, oh, say, all right, so he, uh, he banded them. So therefore the Lord God sent forth from Garden of Eden. In effect, this was an act of mercy. I went over that, okay? And uh, well, he sent Adam out to till the ground. That was part of his punishment. So um, God drove out the man, which implies that I forced, he was displeased with him. God was displeased with Adam. He, he drove him out. Let me get my water real quick over here. I forgot to get it. It's over here. Yeah, so it's right here. So it's like you having like, um, like raccoons or having like animals that you don't want in your house. And what do you do with the broom? You drive them out. So Adam went from being loved by God to being displeased by God to being um, displeasure with God now to being driven out by God. God drove him out, and this was God's love. God loved him, and, and he showed him love. And that tells you how much God loved mankind. And for him to drive him out, his own creation, you know, f from the Garden of Eden. Okay, then, uh, and he placed at the east gate of the Garden of Eden and cherubims, these cherubims signify the holiness of God, which man had now fortified, and a flaming sword, which every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, in the other translation, it said that it was, it was the tree of life, and it was, it was the flaming sword. Now, isn't it interesting that Jesus gave us life on a tree? He died on the tree to give us life. And he is the sword, which is the word of God. He is the sword. He is the word of God. And that tells you... How much God had all this together. God wasn't caught by no unsurprise. He wasn't caught distracted. God knew exactly what to do. And that tells, this tells me how much he loved us and how much uh, he wants us uh, to trust him and to know that, that we're in his hands. You know, that he loves us so much. Even in our, when we stumble and we fall. This is how he paid the price. The love of God, this is the love of God right here. I got this painting for, uh, for Father's Day, and I loved it. It's a painting of Jesus. One of the realest pictures where he would, this is really what he looked like, and, it, and even probably worse than that. And I keep that inside my library room. It, it keeps me in check. It keeps me in check because someday soon we're going to meet him, and, and we're going to thank God that um, because of the Lord going through hell and giving his life, we don't have to go to that terrible place. Amen. For billions of years, millions of years, they're still going to be there. They're still going to be there. They're never going to come out. They're never going to be delivered there. And then it's an appreciation by, for me that, you know, I was a knucklehead growing up. And my mom, my mom was a, a, an alcoholic. She was a, she had eight kids, man. We were homeless. And God saved her first out of all my aunts and uncles. God saved her first. 
And she was made fun of. She was ridiculed. Uh, my aunts left her. They didn't want to be with her no more. Nobody wanted to be with her no more. But my mom never gave up. She never gave up. And even when my little brother, we, we moved into a motel. And uh, my little brother was four years old. And uh, my mom, uh, she's probably going to get mad at me, but it's okay. I'll be an honest mom. She, she could fight. My mom, man, she could fight. You know, she knew, she knew how to hit somebody. Well, my little brother was playing cars, and um, he, he got run over on his head, and it cracked his head. And all of us thought immediately the sin nature was going to come out of my mom. We were all afraid that my mom was going to start. I mean, she didn't. And that was the first time we saw change, and that was the first time I saw the love of God to my mom through God. And so uh, my mom kept it up. She kept going to church. She kept faithful. God was blessing her. Then I come along. I end up getting involved in drugs. I end up getting involved in gangs. I put her through a lot with her seven other kids. But the love of God, the mercy of God that I saw, that God showed her mercy. She saw God's mercy. She saw God's grace. She saw God's everlasting love. She saw God's sacrifice. She saw God when he was on the cross. She knew that he was on her mind. She was on his mind. My mom knew all that because of the mercy and because of the grace of God. And so even from that beginning when the sin nature came and when the sin problem came, uh, um, all it affected billions of people. But I love it because God is personal to each and every one of us. Amen. He is personal to each and every one of us. He's omniscient, and I, and I love that. And his, his grace and his mercies are new every morning, every morning. And um, it, just makes, it just makes me want to just be more fervor for the Lord and be more strong for the Lord and to witness to the people, even to my enemies, even to the people that have hurt me and betrayed me, because I don't want them to go to a place like that forever. I don't want that to happen. And um, there are a lot of people out there, out of our, outside of our four walls, there's hundreds of people that we could share the gospel, share the good news, share the mercies of God, share the grace of God. And, and I think that's one thing that I wanted to bring this message is, is just to remind all of us that we're in that seat of love and forgiveness, and I want it to be in our feet and to move out in the streets and to keep sharing it and keep going. And... Um, now I want to go over some other uh, tips, uh, some other things. Just for some side notes. So I'm not sure if any of you ever go out and witness. Are you afraid to witness? Do you know how to witness? Do you know what to say, how to say it? First of all, let me get my notes here. I like that. We can put notes on our phones now. I like that. And I can make them big, too. All right. Uh, what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be saved? Romans 4, 4 through 8. Uh, what joy for those whose sin is no longer counted against them by the Lord. Now, of course, in my, in my experience, um, I have to educate people on their position as sinners. Just like in our class, we talk about our position as Christians and as believers. Well, sinners don't know their position as sinners. You know, and we have to let the Lord guide us into, uh, and let the Holy Spirit teach us to teach them. First of all, what do, you, what do you tell them? First of all, you've got to create, relate, convict, convert. You've got to create a way to relate to them so the Holy Spirit could uh, convict them, and then we could convert them. Okay, and sometimes you have, uh, you know, it takes, you've got to be a little um, kind of like, uh, not manipulative, but kind of don't give up, you know, just, it's just, one way of saying it is like you walk into somebody's yard. You say, oh, look at those flowers. Those are nice flowers. Yeah, I planted them last week. Oh, yeah, well, I planted some too. So then that's creating. Then you, then you relate to them. And then you talk with, and then you introduce them. They say, can I, uh, can I talk to you about your salvation? Have you ever thought about God? You know? I think sometimes you said something like that. You did, you know, with the one man you told me a couple weeks ago. And that's what, that's what you call that. That's being creative and talking. And another way, uh, another way that I use to witness is uh, this is a, we use the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are a perfect law to conversion. This right here tells you our need. It educates us. It's a schoolmaster. And it's pretty neat because it goes through all the, all the um, Ten Commandments. Have you ever told a lie? No. Have you ever stole something? And I say, no. You say, really? Because you break one command, you break them all. And then back then, you, they, would, they would kill you. They would, you would be, I mean, they would judge you, you know. So you tell them this. My thing with this thing is you say, well, if you don't, Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. So 
you let your judgments be on the cross, if you don't let your judgments of your sins be on the cross, then you're going to have to face judgment with God, the Father, once you're dead. And then you go to them. Then you rather have them, once they see their position as a sinner, you know, then their, their conscience, their conscience is weak. My phone's ringing. Their, their conscience is awake. You know, then, then that's where, see, God has written right and wrong in all of our hearts, in every man's hearts. And we know, and they know that. And that's why a lot of people don't want to serve God, because they don't want to give up their ways. That's their pride. You know, they don't want to give that up. But once you give them this knowledge, they, they have to hold up to it. You know, they have, they're responsible for that knowledge. So it's why it's important that we tell them the true gospel. You know, I'm not the type to be there and to beg somebody to accept the Lord. I'm the type that wants to educate them, and I want them to have a decision. You know, because then what could possibly happen is we can make a false convert. You know, and, I, and we don't want to do that. And in other ways, some people are just, they've been like, uh, the gro fellow ground of their heart's been broken. The, the word of the God watered their hearts, you know, and then you go in and you plant the seed and boom. You know, they're so far deep down in life, they recognize, man, I can't go no farther down. I might as well accept the Lord. Then they discover that the love of God. Then they grow from there. So there's different ways of serving the Lord. There's different ways of, of telling people about Jesus. But by all means, we've got to tell somebody. We've got to tell somebody. The Bible says, he who wins souls is wise. He who wins souls is wise. Oops. Okay, so another scripture is uh, what it means to be saved is, yet now God in his grac gracious kindness declares us not guilty. I like that word, not guilty. When I, when I went to court, I hate sitting inside the seat right there by the judge. Man, because I just felt so bad. I felt so ashamed. I felt so guilty. And man, when you, when that, what was that, the hammer goes down? What do they call that? Yeah, yeah the guy, when I went down, whew, man. You know, I, my, I just like broke out in a sweat. And I almost got sentenced to um, 10 years. I was only 15. If that would have happened, I wouldn't have been at my job. I probably wouldn't have been here. Two of my buddies that I grew up with are both dead. And I was right behind them. But thank God, not guilty. Thank God for his grace and his mercy. So Psalms 103, 11, 12 says, He has removed our rebellious acts as far away from us as the east is from the west. Our sins have been completely removed. You know, like I said, looking at that video, and put, it makes you more suspicious of your own heart. You know what I mean? You want to be pure for God. You want to love God because you, you, he saved us from going to that horrible place by dying on the cross for our sins. He saved us from that. So another one is Psalms 51, 1 and 2. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Being saved means the stain of guilt has been washed away. That happened with King David, even when he sinned with Bathsheba. He, he almost, I believe, committed all, they broke all the commandments. And, and God created him a clean heart, and God forgave him, and God loved him. When, it, when, um, when, when everybody was on, on Brother Swagger's case, when he was sinned, he didn't do nearly as bad as David. And everybody still had their opinions on him and judged him. You know, and I thank God for his grace and his mercy. Okay, and one more for what it means, what, what does it mean to be saved? This is uh, Romans 3, 21, 4. He has done this through Christ, who has freed us by taking away our sins. Being saved means we are forgiven in Christ. So he took them away. That literally means like he took them away. He's like, you ever take something out of somebody's hand? They don't have it no more. It's not on your possession. It's not in our possession anymore. We're new creatures in Christ Jesus. He took that away. So you may be going through a tough time. Okay, you may have fallen, but you belong to Christ. Repent and get up and keep going. Okay. <clears throat> How can I be saved? I'm pretty sure everybody in here is saved. Amen? Everybody in here is saved? Okay. I'm just going through this so, I'm just, so that way we were reminded so that we could help somebody get saved. Okay, how can I be saved? 
Romans 10, 13. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God's word promises salvation to anyone who calls on Jesus' name. Yeah, so <clears throat> even though I gave you those tips on, you know, how to witness, still, all one person, if he's really sincere in his heart and he repents and his conscience knows it and he calls upon the name of the Lord, just like the thief on the cross, he didn't say this in his prayer. He just said, Jesus, remember me. And he went up with Jesus. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So there's, you can't, you can't kind of narrow it down and just have one formula. And that's what I was doing with this for a long time, just using this. But it's, you have to let the Holy Spirit work inside you. They're good tools. These are good tools to have. So another one is, uh, everybody knows this one, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. And John 5, 24, I assure you, those who listen to my message, I assure you, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me he has eternal life. Jesus himself promised that those who believe in him will be saved. Okay, so that's how to be saved. Now, is salvation available to anyone? Of course, everybody knows that, right? But I'm going to go with the scriptures anyways. Luke 2, 11, 12. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born tonight in Bethlehem. Jesus was born into a humble stable among very ordinary people to powerfully demonstrate that salvation is available to anyone who sincerely seeks him. Revelation 20, 11, 21, 3. And the dead were judged according to the things written in the book. Salvation is available to all, but a time will come when it will be too late to receive it. I believe that's going to be during the, the, the rebel, uh, seven day, um, lost that word, tribulation. That's what I think they say. Okay, how can I be sure of my salvation? Has anybody ever doubted their salvation? Question it? I know I did, especially when I was running from the Lord, because I'm a good runner. I ran all my, most of my life, but I can't run from God. I cannot run from him, and I doubted during that time, but he's kept me back here. Mm -hmm. So 1 Peter 1 and 5, God in his mighty power will protect you until you receive his salvation. Salvation brings the sure hope of eternal life. So, there's those people who say you can't lose your salvation. I believe once you actually receive the Lord and you believe in your heart that he died on the cross for your sins and you repented and there's that way that you're walking right, I believe you're saved. But there's a lot of people because of unhealed hurts, unresolved issues, they fall, they stumble, and they have emotional problems. They have strongholds like we're dealing with. And um, it causes them to stay down longer. You know, it doesn't mean they're not saved. It means they, ha they have to grow emotionally maturely. They have to grow. And we have to be patient with them. Because God, God is patient with me. I tell you this. I don't know how Pastor Gary put up with me all these years. Because <laughs> Pastor Gary, I appreciate Pastor Gary because... He, he sees the gift in God in people. He sees the, the calling of God, even though when we don't see it. Pastor sees it. He knows it. He knows it. And I've told Pastor Lucy many times, I know I frustrated Pastor, but I'm still here. I'm still here. Yeah. So... so... I'm trying to find... Okay. So now Romans 6, 1 and 11 says, So you should consider yourselves dead to sin and able to live for the glory of God. So now that we're saved and we know we're saved, now it's our reasonable service like Pastor was saying, and there's a destiny for us and there's a calling, there's a purpose for us in God. It's not in our personal things that we want to do. The scripture gives us these promises for the will of God, for the church of God, not for our own pleasures, not for our own 
um, personal life per se. But it's to build up his kingdom. And now that we know all this, and we are sure, and that we know our position in Christ, um, <clears throat> now it's time for us to use our new standing with Christ and our position in Christ, now that we're clean, now that we're, uh, uh, we're anointed and we're appointed, and uh, there's a destiny in our life, and it has to do with the kingdom of God. And mostly where it's like where we have to follow through, this is our, this is our mission ground right here. This is our, not our mission ground, but our base. And we've got to find out what God's plan is for, in our life, in this church, for this church. You know, <clears throat> I like what you said, Santos, on Saturday, you know, um, it's about being excellent, you know, about being that man that God wants to be, doing something, go the extra mile, you know, do something that's probably created for the church. Go out and, you know, uh, we want to compel the people to come in, and we want God to use us to encourage them, and we want to be out there to be uh, followers of Christ. We want them to see that. We want them to see Christ in us. We want them to know our loving God, and we have to... Uh, uh, Fortify ourselves, and we have to stand strong. We have to stay planted, not run, and we got to find out God's will for our life because He said that it's our reasonable, pur- our reasonable purpose, and pursue God for this place, for this church. Pursue Him for what? What? What's pastor's heart? You know, what does our pastor want? Let's pick His arms up. Let's be His hands extended because He's working for Christ, and and I believe that's what it's all about. That's why I believe I'm still here. That's why I believe I'm still here. I, I can't get away from it. It's like a, a magnet. But we have to be assured of our salvation. We have to know that God is in control of our plans. We have to know that he has a purpose and there's a destiny. Um, let me share this. I'm almost done. I'll share this one more thing. About two years ago, I brought Pat um, Miller here, the guy that was trying to get recruits for juvenile hall. And uh, I went to go get my uh, clearance for juvenile hall. It took uh, one and a half years to get it. Most people, it took three months, but because of my juvenile hall record, and uh, I kind of gave up on it, and you know, I got kind of tired of it, and he got frustrated because he thought I should have got it already, so he gave up, you know, he stopped calling me. Well, like two weeks ago, uh, I had to go get my uh, tags put in AAA, and for some reason, uh, it was in Monrovia, I, I got, right when I parked my truck, uh, a thought came to my head, I need to continue to go to juvenile hall and go help those kids. I want you to know it. I'm waiting in line. Here comes Pat Miller, and I hadn't seen him in a year and a half. I haven't seen him in a year and a half. And uh, so he walked by me. He didn't even recognize me. So uh, I'm waiting, right? Uh, I have this cup, and I'm, I paid my, uh, my tags, and I was a little hesitant to go talk to him because he had two other people there. So I walked out, not knowing I left this cup inside the AAA. So I got on my truck. I said, wow, oh, man, I don't want to go back in there. So I went back in there. I saw it. And immediately, I felt led that I had to go and see and talk with him. And so now I'm reconnected with him. Now the Lord had opened up doors. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. We want to reach these people. Their souls, they're lost. They don't know. They're still reachable. They're still reachable. And being the fact that God knows what he's doing, I came where they came from. You know, and that's how God's going to use us. There's people that you can reach that I cannot reach. You know, who will be able to relate to these little gang members in here, unless you've been in that road? You know, and it's all about souls. The economy here has to do with money. The economy in heaven is souls. That's the economy in heaven. It's souls, 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 souls. And that's what it's all about. And the sooner we get ourselves out of the way and let God be the way in us, I think we'll uh, be a lot more sure that we are in the will of God and we're doing the will of God. Amen? Amen. So that's all I got to share about that. You know, that's all I want to say about that. I hope that was okay. You know, just want you guys to remember that love of Jesus, you know, the love of God. Remember your salvation. It is secure. It is strong. But being that you are safe from such a terrible place called eternal hell, have compassion on the sinner that you've walked across, knowing that you don't want them to go to a horrible, terrible place like that. Remember, we're all saved from it. And because of what Jesus did on the cross. Amen. I'll go ahead and close in prayer. I'll pray. I'm going to pray. Okay? Okay. Jesus, I just want to thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercies, for it's new every morning, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that you just infuse, that you put that fire in us, Lord God. Remind us, Lord God, how saved we are, Lord God, and that 
there's a terrible place that you delivered us from, Lord God. Give us that heart for souls, Lord God. Give us the heart, Lord God, for people in general. Enemies, Lord God, uh, people, Lord God, it, it, just in general, Lord God, whoever, just give us that heart to share your good news with them, Lord God. And to have authentic salvations, Lord God, authentic transformations, Lord God. Open up. Give us a gift in our mouth, this church, Lord God. Give us the gift, Lord God, of that message, Lord God, the communication to minister to families, Lord God, to see them converted, Lord God, to see them enter into eternal life, Lord. Thanking you in the name of Jesus, Lord. I pray, Lord God, for those who have left the church, Lord God, who know that they belong here. I pray that you bring them back, Lord God. I pray that you'll encourage them, Lord God, strengthen them, remind them, Lord God, what they were saved from, Lord God. Let them know that you have a destiny, Lord God, for them in this church, Lord God, that you have a purpose for them in this church, Lord God, that you have a calling for them in this church, Lord God. Lord God, that you have a plan for them in this, in this church, Lord God. I pray for all those, Lord God, that will, they'll come back, Lord God, and work for your kingdom, Lord God. Build up your church in the name of Jesus, Lord. I just want to thank you, Father, for our pastor. I thank you for our leaders here, Lord God, who have been faithful, Lord God, ho holding up the banner, Lord God, of your grace and of your mercy and of your love, Lord God. I pray that you bless the leaders here, Lord God. Bless their families. Save some of their ones that went wayward, Lord God, that are not serving you. Save mine, Lord God, that stopped serving you, stopped going to church, Lord God. Save them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And I just pray for all the children, Lord God, that they'll grow up in this church, Lord God, knowing that the main message is the cross and him crucified, Lord God. For I boast in the cross and only in the cross. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, for being obedient, for loving me, for loving my family, for restoring my family, Lord God, for loving my mom, for loving my mom, my family. Thank you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Amen.